Welcome to section six of cardiology. In this section, I will be discussing the Starling curve and cardiac and vascular function curves. Let's get started. This is figure 2.8 from your text, which shows a Starling curve. The y-axis is cardiac output, and the x-axis is preload. Let's look at the normal line first. As you can see, as preload increases, the cardiac output increases. But this only occurs up to a point, and then we can see that the curve begins to taper off. In order to understand this, let's take a step back and pull up a blank screen. Recall from musculoskeletal histology that a sarcomere is the fundamental unit of striated muscle, and cardiac muscle is a type of striated muscle. So I'll draw the sarcomere here. So in the sarcomere, we can see that the Z line is right here. And coming off, we have actin right here. In between the strands of actin, there is the myosin. These represent the myosin heads. So as the volume of blood in the heart increases, or as preload increases, the sarcomere gets stretched. And the tension between the myosin heads and the actin increases. The increased tension allows the heart to contract with greater force and pump a greater volume of blood, so cardiac output increases. So again, we have increased preload. causes increased tension, which results in increased cardiac output. However, if the volume increases too much, then the tension between the myosin heads and actin is such that it's harder for the heart to pump out the same volume of blood. I think this is easier to understand if you do the following exercise. So flex your wrist, and then try to make a fist You'll notice it's a lot more difficult than just trying to make a fist without flexing your wrist. This is similar to the idea I'm describing with the heart. The sarcomeres have an optimal length tension relationship, which is the basis for understanding the Starling curve. So now that you understand the normal curve, let's explain the other two curves. Recall from section three that inotropism or inotropy refers to changes in contractility. So we can see positive inotropy and negative inotropy here. Remember, contractility is directly related to the concentration of intracellular calcium. So if there's increased contractility, this means there's increased cytosolic calcium. If more calcium is available, then more troponin C is able to move tropomyosin from the actin sites, which means more myosin combined actin, resulting in a more forceful contraction. So positive inotropes, like epinephrine and norepinephrine, increase contractility. We can see that the curve shifted here. If we look at the graph, we can see that under these conditions, the heart pumps more blood with the same preload compared to normal. So if we just draw a line here, we can see that cardiac output has gone from here to here with the same preload. Unlike the normal curve, the length tension relationship of the sarcomere is not the major contributor to increased cardiac output. The major contributor is increased intracellular calcium. This makes sense. The volume in the heart hasn't increased, so the length tension relationship of the sarcomere couldn't have changed either. Conversely, negative inotropes, like beta blockers, will decrease the concentration of intracellular calcium, causing the cardiac output to decrease with the same preload. So again, if we draw out the dashed line, we can see that the preload is the same, but the cardiac output decreased from right here right here. It's important to know that changes in afterload 
also have a similar effect to changes in inotropy. In other words, a decrease in afterload means the heart has to pump against less resistance, so the cardiac output will increase for a given preload. In this case, decreasing afterload would cause the Starling curve to shift left. An increase in afterload would cause the Starling curve to shift right. Increase afterload. In summary, two things can cause shifts in the Starling curve, inotropy and afterload. Okay, with this in mind, let's see what your text says. The Starling curve is a way to graphically measure cardiac output as a function of preload. Cardiac output increases as preload increases up to a point. Changes in inotropy cause shifts in the Starling curve, and changes in afterload also cause shifts in the Starling curve. Okay, moving on to cardiac and vascular function curves. This is figure 2.9 from your text, which shows a normal cardiac and vascular function curve. This figure can be very confusing for a lot of students because it's an image of two graphs overlapped on top of each other. In order to make things more confusing, there are multiple variables on the axes. The x-axis has right atrial pressure or end diastolic volume, and the y-axis has cardiac output or venous return. Let's talk about the x-axis for a moment and draw this out on a blank screen. Okay, so here's a sketch of the heart. This is the right atrium, the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery, the left atrium, the left ventricle, and the aorta. Imagine for a moment that 100 milliliters of blood enters the right atrium. And this blood exerts a force of five millimeters of mercury. When the x-axis is labeled right atrial pressure, we're focusing on the five millimeters of mercury of pressure in the atrium rather than the 100 milliliters of blood itself. Eventually, this same 100 milliliters of blood gets pumped into the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery, the left atrium, and then the left ventricle. Typically, the volume of blood in the left ventricle is used to determine end diastolic volume, or EDV. So you can see that if the 100 milliliters of blood entered the right atrium, then that same 100 milliliters of blood must enter the left ventricle a few moments later. So when the x-axis is labeled end diastolic volume, we're focusing on the 100 milliliters of blood, not the pressure exerted on the walls of the ventricles by the 100 milliliters of blood. In other words, right atrial pressure and end diastolic volume are essentially telling us the same thing. It's just being expressed in different units. With that in mind, let's return to the figure. Because the x-axis has two variables that are essentially telling us the same thing, I like to just focus on the variable of the x-axis that makes more sense conceptually whenever I analyze these figures. I'll explain this more in a second. On the other hand, the y-axis has two variables that are telling us two different things. The first variable is cardiac output, and the second is venous return. Remember, cardiac output is how much blood leaves the heart, and venous return is how much blood returns to the heart. It's important to know that the y-axis variables coincide with the green and blue curves seen in this figure. So the cardiac output variable of the y-axis is illustrated with the green curve. The venous return variable of the y-axis is illustrated with the blue curve. Let's take a step back and separate the two curves for a moment and then return to this image.